Welcome to How Rugby Made Me, brought to you by British Airways. My name's Katie Daly-McLean, and today I'm in Bear Country to meet an old friend. I played alongside her back in the day at Dance and Marden Park when she made her debut over a decade ago. Since then, she's gone on to amass over 60 caps for her country, won several Grand Slams, and even bagged herself a Premiership title. But that isn't the most exciting bit. England and Bristol Bears' Abby Ward is now the proud mum to baby Halley. And the best bit, she has full intentions of getting back on the pitch for both club and country this season. Let's go see if we can find her and maybe have a little nosy. Kate McLean. Hello. How you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm good, so good to see you. More importantly, where is Halley? She is with her dad somewhere, so we'll track her down. We'll have a bit of a tour. What's this? I'll show you around. That is... Is that in case you forget it? That, that is the smell it. Just, yeah, <laughs> just in case you need it. Always prepped. I'm excited for the tour. Yeah. Obviously, in the gym, you've seen plenty of those. I know, but although new... you used to dodge them. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> a new gym, that is it's smart, isn't it? It is. Are you a little bit jealous? It's OK to admit it. <laughs> I've got to admit, it is a very impressive facility. Like, just all the corridors and doors, what's in there? Um, analysis, so like all the Macs, all the screens, wow, honours board, stuff like that. What's great oh, is you, that... You know what it is? That's amazing, because you've got a women's one as yeah. well. Yeah. The women's uh, and the men, and just walking down here, obviously you've got all the international men, you've got all the international women. It's not like this is just for the men and we're a little side note. It is, yeah. we are, you know, made to feel like this is our home as well. I think because it's obviously purpose-built as well, the space is allowed, do you think most women's teams come into a men's existence? Yeah. Whereas obviously this has been built for you guys. So like, like you say, the wall, all the little touches, the honours board, yeah. you're not being squeezed into a space that doesn't exist. Definitely. It is, it's really lovely. So this is it. Is Hallie going to be there? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Baby Hallie! <laughs> oh my God, you are cute, don't you? Anybody tell you what that is? So this is obviously where the magic happens. We can hear the, the guys outside training. Tell me about it. It looks amazing. And if I'm honest, probably a little bit jealous. Yeah, it's amazing. These facilities It is, you know, one of the reasons why I came here, not just the facilities, but also the fact that you know, it's not just for the men, it's for the men and the women. And that is part of the vision of um, Bristol Bears and of Steve Lansdowne and what he's trying to do with Bristol Sport. So yeah, it, it's a pretty cool place to be able to come to work and to be here day in, day out. When you obviously were looking about moving clubs, yeah. were Bristol in this facility? Did, was this the first place you came to get to see this? Yes, yeah. So I came here and got shown around by Joe Joyce, which shows as well, like, you know, that affinity between the, the men's and the women's. A lot of clubs you speak to, a lot of places you go, they speak about it. But in, in real life, it doesn't happen. You know, you get told all oh, the men and women will be on equal standing, but it doesn't work out that way. So to actually see it, like, you know, living and breathing. And also it helped that I know what Dave's like. I know um, how much energy he would bring to the programme, the details and, and the standards that he would have for the whole programme. So that kind of put me at ease a little bit as well. I suppose it does help having your husband as a head coach for a kind of an inside line in terms of the vibe that the club brings. Yeah, absolutely. Hallie, don't worry, we're coming to you, sweetheart. So we, obviously... Um, and it, like, even on that, we talk about like the facilities and having everything that you could want. Like as a mum as well, this place has been great. Um, I haven't had to ask or do anything or they've just been so proactive. A few weeks okay. ago, they came to me and were like, by the way, we fitted changing facilities yeah. in the toilets. It's little yeah. things like that that I think as as women athletes, as rugby players, you're just so used to like making do. 100%. And like, it's not a necessity. Like if she's in, there's always somewhere that I'll be able to change her. But just for that consideration, for them to say, here is where you can store milk. Here, do you want another room for expressing? This is where you can change her. Like all off their own back. And like I said, it's being that proactive as... Um, it's pretty amazing and I think that just is another thing that illustrates, you know, what this club is trying to do. I think it's huge. I think from my own experiences, having like breastfeeding twins when they were younger, like in a toilet, in a disabled toilet, because actually there was no provision. Yeah. And you've gone to some big clubs, especially doing some 
extra bits and pieces and that, oh, do you have anywhere where I can do this? No. So the fact that, like you say, they've, they've thought about that, that consideration yeah. to you just becomes the norm. And, and ultimately, that's where we hope the game will go. Yeah, and they haven't had to be prompted. That's, yeah. that's for me, that is the key thing. That's that you don't feel like, okay, I've got to ask for this. I've got to ask for that. How is that being received? Am I like another problem I don't want mum again yeah it's, it's not like that at all it's great and like you can see I can bring Hallie in and um, how could you not bring her in plenty her. of hands that want to hold her and look after her and yeah it's just another day at work isn't it Hallie so obviously Hallie's here mm. how long she how long has she been here she is almost 12 weeks old so yeah and how has life, how's life changed for both you and Dave? Yeah, as you know, it's amazing. It's the most, you know, special time. You're a little rascal, but um, she's great. She's so, she's so chill. She's just, I say that as she's wriggling around and I'll probably palm her off to her dad in a minute. But yeah, we've just, she's come in and she just comes along to everything with us. On the weekend, we were playing Exeter away in the cup. I was sat on the bench and she was sat with me. And she was loving it. She was like, oh, this is that thing we watch on TV all the time, but it's in front of me. <laughs> so yeah, take her out to games, take her to Ashton Gate, take her to the Balloon Fiesta. She comes along with us. Um, she's touch wood. I don't want to um, jinx it, but she's sleeping great. She's feeding great. She loves being around so many different people. You know, everyone has a hold. Everyone, you know, has a little play with you. So yes, they do. So yeah, we're just loving it. We're enjoying it. It's, it definitely is um, a sh bit of a shock to the system at first with the sleep. Yeah. But you just adapt, you adjust, and then it's fine. Are you a sleeper? I am a sleeper. Was Dave well, a sleeper? before Hallie, I was a yeah prolific sleeper, napper. <laughs> we would nap every day for at least an hour, me and Dave, and then. Um, I haven't napped since. No? No. <laughs> but um, some t actually, no, I lie. We did have one family nap, weeks. which was good. Hallie behaved and she also had a nap with us all on the sofa. But yeah, it's amazing how I've always been like, oh, I need my sleep. If I don't get my sleep, then I'm terrible. But you just adjust and then it, it's fine. And actually, like in the mornings, um, Dave might take her downstairs and we'll do like the morning feed with her. And then sometimes I don't even want to lie in that much because I've got a bit of FOMO. I'm like, what are they doing? What are they watching? <laughs> well, I want to go and see what they're doing. Um, but Who yeah. Who does the night feed? To be fair, Dave's been doing a lot recently. Um, and that's what works so well is it genuinely is. It's like a team effort and we take it in turns. You guys have been watching the baseball because obviously that's on at ridiculous times. <laughs> um, but yeah, she only has one night feed and then she sleeps through. So. Oh, you are a good one. Yeah. <laughs> and how's your body? So obviously like she's gorgeous and she's here. Mm. You trained pretty much right up until... Three, two days you before, dropped. yeah. Two yeah. days before. And you had a planned C-section yeah. all booked in, all ready to yeah. go. Talk us through that, because my birth was slight, slightly different to that. <laughs> yeah, you know what? It was it was so chilled. Um, I've had more stressful haircuts, I think. And it's, <laughs> I don't want to play it down, but it was almost it's surreal how chilled it was. They send you a, a text, arrive at this time next week, and then we okay. arrived... They're like, you're number two in the queue. <laughs> I was like, I don't even think at this point it had really um, sunk in that we were having a baby. Yeah. And then what was amazing, it, it was like we'd won an experience. Because <laughs> we're, we're there waiting to go in and then the nurse is like, right, passes your phone, let's get a picture of you both. Um, oh, is she going? Holly, I think you've got to go. You're too noisy. So here comes Dave. Hi, Dave. Hello, hello, hello. I've come to take her away. It's like because you had FOMO and you missed her. Yeah, always, always. I'm always wondering what she's up to. So I like to, we'd like to give each other little updates, <laughs> little pictures of uh, me and Hallie watching baseball at 3 a.m. 3 yeah. <laughs> it's great. Um, yeah. All good? Yeah, all good. Bye, Hallie. He's a good one, isn't he? Yeah. Anyway, back to your dentist appointment. Yeah, so it was pretty surreal. So she's like, let's take a picture. You go through, obviously... A little spinal tap. Um, you had an epidural? It wasn't an epidural. Just a nerve block? Yes, that's the nice. one. And um, it took maybe five minutes for them to cut me open and then pull Did they have out. the big sheet so you, you couldn't see anything? Yeah. Um, 
and and Dave was there. And then the anaesthetist as well was like, oh, I'll film some bits. <laughs> so it passes your phone. So we had one nurse taking photos of us. We were just like, we didn't ask for any of this. We were just going along with it. It was genuinely like we'd, we'd won an experience. He was taking these videos and then he'd be like, oh, this is a really good opportunity as well. I'll get this. And yeah, they pulled her out, um, which was crazy because even then I think we hadn't really... And how long is that from? So you've, what time have you gone in? And we went in from half seven. We did get pushed back one because there was an emergency C-section, but she was with us at like 11. Maybe. Okay, so like a four hour experience. Yeah, of just, but a lot of it was just waiting to begin with, then when we were in, and then so five minutes to um, pull her out, um, maybe 20 minutes to put me back together. And then that was it, we, we were wheeled through to recovery um, with this baby thinking, oh my gosh, <laughs> she's actually here. <laughs> she's here. Um, and then out, out the next day, um, so I think it was 25 hours after we went in or after she was, yeah, she was here. Then we were, we were back out and then back at home, not knowing what to do as, as new parents. Um, when you shut yeah. the front door, you realise that you're in charge of this yes. tiny little yes, being. Yes, yes, but she's definitely made herself at home now. <laughs> and I suppose, obviously you had a planned C-section. Like I say, mine was slightly different emergency yeah. C-section. A lot more people... Are, None of this nice, there was no nice pictures. Yeah. I don't think there's any nice pictures for about a week of me. I look a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and I'd be bedraggled, should we say. Do you think like the that helped with in terms of your training? Because obviously your intention is to be back playing soon. Yeah. Do you think all of this kind of has allowed you to really kind of prepare your body? You play a contact sport, it's not. It, yeah, there was a lot of thought that went into it about the birth mode, how I'd give birth essentially. Um, it, we spoke to a lot of different people, um, different women's health physios, the surgeon who was unbelievable, Tim Draycott at Southmead, spoke to him a lot. And there was lots of different things that we considered, some of that being Hallie and how big she would be. And okay. she was on like the 97th percentile. So she was always going to be a big baby. Um, and because of that, you know, they didn't want me going over term. They would... Yeah induce me and then that in turn you know you have a higher chance of you know force delivery yeah. or tearing Tear, yeah. and uh, and then that leads to a much longer return yeah. it was really interesting because i think c-sections planned c-sections are still you know taboo when yeah, i chatted about it before yeah you know. when i first told people that i was going to have a planned c-section some of the reactions would be like why are you doing that you know Oh, I don't think you should do that straight away. And it's like, hang on a minute. Like, I have thought about it. It's not just, you know, off off a whim. But I think it's just people not knowing, maybe a little bit of ignorance as well. But also, like, we have such amazing professionals. And it was definitely the right thing for, for Hallie and for me and would cause, you know, the least amount of distress. You can plan it, which, you know, as an athlete planning is like it's huge it is huge so yeah I was really happy with exactly how it went Hallie you know is a perfect baby thriving um yeah she's thriving and like I say it was so nice because it was such a relaxed environment um and then we knew exactly what we would be dealing with in terms of recovery in okay. terms of rehab if I'd gone for a a natural birth I would have loved to have done that. I'd have loved to go through the process. And I think I probably would have put myself under a bit of pressure to do that. I think a lot of women do because they feel like that's the proper way where there is no, there is no yeah, way. I, got half, I went half and half. I was like, right, I'll have a natural birth until yeah. I couldn't and then end up with emergency C-section. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Being able to plan and to do that and just to know, know what's going to happen. It would have been great if I could have done that, but you just don't know what you're going to end up with. Yeah. No, no tearing and a nice relaxed mm. birth would be great, but you could also be at the other end yeah. of the scale where you have third degree tears and then my rehab is looking like it's another four months after that, yeah. if not more, because I don't think they've really seen any athletes return with, you know, really bad tearing. Yeah. Um, so C-section, knew exactly what I was getting into and we'd, we'd even before the birth, we'd already had the 17-week rehab plan written down. So you knew when once Hallie was here... All went to plan. 
And how soon post your C-section ha- did you return to exercise? Two weeks, because legally you have to take two weeks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I took the legal minimum and then... That is Abby Ward. Yeah, then was back in here on that, that Friday. And in your two weeks, I can't imagine you just sitting still. No. I think it was six days after we went and did the big shop and um, put her in a carrier, walked around and just, um, we tried to get out as soon as we could. For me as well, my body is the best when it's moving. As soon as I stop doing stuff, that's when it really seizes up. I've come back in some of the worst condition after a holiday, just as in things start aching, things start. So So you're going to talk about your partying days there. Yeah, no. So I'm not looking forward to retirement. But um, (laughs) It's great. So yeah, I just wanted to move, wanted to be in. And you know what? The other thing as well, it is tough and you are tired and it is draining. But coming in and seeing the girls, getting back into a bit of a routine gave me so much more energy. And you would think adding on three or four hours of training on top of night feeds and looking after a a newborn would make you even more tired. But it gave me more energy. There must be something that you haven't missed though. I mean, Um, I love your positivity, but there there must be something that you're like, oh, this again. Yeah, I mean, rehab's like that, let's be honest. Rehab is not fun. The worst part of, you know, being any type of athlete is when, when you're rehabbing it. And it's the hardest work. And it's just the little steps. It is a bit tedious when so you just you sat the, on the bike. The beginning bit when you literally just had to do a little bit of ab engagement or a little bit of glutes, the kind of small isolated stuff. Is that the bit that you've so far found? I mean, we're only 11 weeks in, yeah, but that you um, found the hardest. Not found the hard because I've enjoyed it. Well, I've learned to enjoy on, every part of it. There's got to be some down bits of this. Um, it's all great. I could list loads. <laughs> <laughs> i tell you what's been the worst. Cool, few is when you're training by yourself. Okay. That's tough. So it's great when you're in here when I'm doing stuff with the girls, but then they'd go off to do their their on-pitch stuff. So they'd all leave, go up onto the pitch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, I'll just go down into the gym and cycle by myself for an hour. <laughs> so yeah, that hasn't been okay. fun. Last week was a week off, so everyone, you know, went away and got that downtime, but I was still in every day because it's rehab, isn't it? Yeah. So yesterday, one of the girls was like, oh, did you have a fun week off? What did you do? <laughs> I was like, there are no such thing as weeks off. <laughs> That's tough. But all of that gets me a step closer to playing and being back fully integrated. And so on that then, do you have a, a date in mind that you want to return and you want to be back playing? And I suppose knowing you, what like what are the pressures that you've put on yourself to achieve that? I do, without giving too much away as Sale DOR, it would be the first game of the season, <laughs> which is Sale. I think that's looking a bit soon. <laughs> I think the second not. one looks a bit Maybe better. the game before, sailing the cup as well. Yeah. Sail back to back. Back to back. Live on TV. Yes. Yeah, I definitely want it to be back for the first game of the season. Okay. So we had that 17-week time frame, and timeline. that take you to? That takes us to that. And that was always my aim. But at the same time, I was like, look, if, if I can't do it, then we can push things back. Likewise, if we're flying, things might come forward more stuff has come forward like I'm ahead of where I want to be but what's quite nice is because of how the cup works um and the premiership there is a gap in between yeah it's a couple of weeks isn't there which means I don't I'm not putting pressure on myself because if there was a game the week before would I be thinking oh I could play that one or I could play the one before that whereas there is that gap that game or that um that point of me returning to playing that's not moving the stuff in between might move but actually it just gives me more time in full training and do you think because I I definitely found this and we'll we'll touch on like Marley later on Mm. but do you think Hallie has changed that bit of you the the one that would have said well I could have done it three weeks earlier rather than actually being that your fixed point or do you think actually that's just you as a person you're very logical if you've got a date you'll work to that date I don't think she's changed that. I am logical. I'm also, I just love rugby. It is my job. Yeah. And it's very competitive. You can, at the moment, you're only professional if you contracted to England. There's only 32 spots, right? Yeah. That is hugely competitive. There's so much talent coming through. I provide for Hallie in many different ways. One of that is, you know, a salary, a monthly income, a roof over her head. And that is through my job, which is being a professional rugby player. And I want to make sure that I can get back and I guess prove my worth um, back as an international to make sure that I can pick up my next contract 
you're not the first rugby player to have a baby, but you are the first Red Rose to utilise the maternity policy. Mm. How has, I know we've just talked about the financial stuff, how has that made a difference to you? And do you think you would have had Hallie had that policy not been in place? Really good question. It Thank wasn't... <laughs> It's one of my own. <laughs> it definitely wasn't, was it? <laughs> um, it? It wasn't actually fully in place right, okay. before we knew we were having Hallie, but I knew that a lot of work was going on in the background. It wasn't something that they hashed together overnight. They'd been working on it yeah. for, you know, over a year. They had player input as well, and they were speaking to other nations, which I think is amazing, mm. to kind of find best practice and, and what's working. Having said that, to have a maternity policy in place, I think more than anything, it has changed attitudes okay. of not just players, but of staff and of the environment. So actually, I could feel like, okay, I'm having a baby and that's that's okay. And actually, it's a really positive thing. Whereas, and I don't know, like from from your your experience, I think previously, I found that it, it was a bit like, is this an inconvenience? Or I just think, for, especially for me, I wouldn't have planned to have had a family then, mainly because, of, like you say, our contracts were maybe 12, 18 months. Yeah. So almost like you couldn't have afforded, and especially because I was older as well, I couldn't have afforded probably to take that time out of my career and then come back and expect to be contracted. There was no security, which then meant like things like mortgages and how it has a knock on on everybody. So I, for me, I, I didn't even see it as an option almost if I wanted to have a family, yeah. I had to stop playing rugby. 100%. And I think that's what is just such a huge shame. And I think they're of a lot of people that have, have put it off until later when potentially they would have loved to start families sooner yeah. or people who have curtailed their careers, have, have stopped their careers earlier than they, you know, they've got plenty of years left playing, but they've chosen to stop to start a family. One thing that I noticed um, looking across the men's squad and the women's squad, our women's squad here, and I'm sure at most clubs, is a lot younger. Yeah. Um, I'm now one of the old players and it's like... I don't think I'm that old. Um, <laughs> whereas in the in the men's side, they play for a lot more years. And I don't know if it's because almost you get to a certain point and it's like, okay, I've got to grow up now and stop doing my hobby because I want to have a family or actually get an income that's, you know, livable. Yeah. Um, so hopefully that will change things. And one of the reasons as well why I wanted to get back is to show that you can have a baby and then continue it's not one or the other and you know if that makes players feel more comfortable that they can do so within their playing career like I said I want to share my my career with Hallie do you think she's changed your motivation I think she's added motivation I think Ooh. I've always been highly motivated Which particularly around like my rugby career if you will and my competitiveness I've always wanted to be the best wanted to win everything there is to win I want to go and win more Six Nations win more premierships um you know compete against all the best second rows in the world like that is what I want to do and I've always kind of set my standards and the standards for any team that I've been in you know quite up here Hallie I think has added a different side to that and I think I was aware of this a couple of years ago but it's just kind of I guess it's grown and that side is that actually it's not just about me and I think in my career I'd always thought of myself here and it would I was aware of everyone that's come before me so the likes of yourself Sun Whoa, Earth, we were Skaz. together not before so long this. time before long time before <laughs> um whereas now I'm way more aware of everyone that's coming after me okay. and those girls that are coming up through and the difference that I can try and make to them. And I think part of the, I guess, the shaping of that is my nieces. They're mad about rugby. Hallie. But then just, I think, as you as you grow, as you become more of a senior player as well, that's a big part of it. And, you know, we, we were lucky to be part of that, that change from amateur to professionalism and the fact that it never was a job whereas now it is and you can genuinely say we can genuinely say to our daughters if you want to go and play rugby and be a professional rugby player you can do it and like I don't get emotional but like that's so special because that was a really tough conversation growing up and yeah and they can do that the opportunity is there for them so do you think yeah. you feel more responsibility than now um, a bit more weight on your shoulders to really 
forge a path and have the difficult conversations because of what you want and your aspirations for Halley? I think more responsibility to do that, but I don't think it's weight on the shoulders. I actually feel like the weight's off the shoulders that I can have that conversation because I don't care. Like, <laughs> I, think I'm, I think I'm a good person. When you said, oh, you know, are you proud that you're one of the first people to do it? I think I was probably a good person to do it because if something in the policy isn't right um, or <laughs> isn't working, I'm quite happy to say, yeah, it's okay, but you need to change it. This isn't good. This isn't working. That isn't working. Think about this. And I don't mind doing that. I don't mind, you know, um, rustling a, f a few feathers every now and again, because <laughs> at the end of the day, it's about what is going to work best for the players and look into the future. I, I think it's amazing. I think it is like sitting here not having the choices that you had. I think it's inspiring because somebody was always going to have to go first. Mm. And I don't think that it's easy because, like you say, there'll be so many frustrations that people just hadn't thought about it because it hasn't been experienced. Yeah. Have you found that, obviously, Hallie goes to nursery on a, a Tuesday, like that drop-off, that we, you will have seen it, that bit about like mum guilt and that feel. Yeah. Have you started to experience that yet? Well, I don't <laughs> do the drop-off because it's early. <laughs> Get into the um, truth of it now. Mum guilt is really a thing, isn't, isn't it? it? Everything you do, it's like there's always some mum guilt. Um I think what was great is about because she went to nursery so early, so she started going from seven weeks. Okay. And were you terrified? I, I feel terrified talking about it with yeah, you. Yeah. I wasn't even aware that babies could go to mm. nursery. And it wasn't until speaking to um our England physio Ash, she did the same with her daughter. Okay. And I just hadn't even thought of it as a concept and we were like working out how is this going to work you know with me and Dave and us both having like the same hours in rugby yeah it's and not like I suppose you can say I won't be, he can't come on a Tuesday night exactly. and I'll do a Thursday exactly so she said she did that and I was like oh right and actually it's been great and I think because we did it from from so early yeah it was just normal. I think if we'd waited a year and then I dropped her off, I'd be like, no, she's back. clinging to you. Yeah, they, they, they're great though. They send um, pictures and videos on this little app at the nursery to see, you know, what she's up to. It's quite funny because, I mean, she's 11 weeks old. She's a baby, so she doesn't do much. And a lot <laughs> of the time it'll say, Hallie has slept for two hours. Hallie is awake. Hallie has slept for an hour. Hallie's... And it's like, <laughs> great, we're paying for someone to watch her sleep but um but yeah it's funny because she's in a, a I say a classroom <laughs> every, <laughs> with all like the older kids and I think they're just like whoa there's there's a baby so I did ask when I went to pick her up recently if she'd made any friends and they were like nope <laughs> <laughs> nope not yet <laughs> not yet there's just Hallie but um but she is making eye contact so yeah she's joining um, in the conversations <laughs> so on that then obviously we, we've talked a little bit about I suppose how the responsibility and the opportunities that you have to be able to shape the impact you think this environment here will have on Hallie as she grows up and I mm. suppose it comes back to what you were saying earlier about the aspirations we can have for our daughters yeah. of I remember being a young girl thinking actually the only sporting in like role model I had was Sally Gunnell and I was yeah. never going to be a, a hurdler. So yeah. if I wanted to play rugby, I was going to have to be... <laughs> You've got long legs, have you not, Katie? <laughs> I was going to have to be like Johnny Wilkins or Dan Carter. Yeah. But actually you think for yeah. Hallie, she's going to grow up like alongside seeing Hannah Bottom and yeah. Kira Beverin. It's tough being a girl. It's tough being a girl growing up and I'm really excited for her to grow up in this environment and for loads of different reasons to be surrounded by so many like strong powerful women cool. um, that are confident but also like rugby as a sport one to 15 so many different shapes and sizes everyone's got different attributes different skills different things that they're good at different things that they're not so good at and that's okay because you need one to 15 to make it work so actually like Hallie can see that you know, all sh shapes and sizes, it's okay. Or oh, there's just such a variety of characters and for her to be surrounded by that, but surrounded by, like I said, so many different role models, so many different aunties. Um, if you had to pick one auntie that you would like her to be like, it's <sighs> a great question as well, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> You're only allowed one. Obviously, we'll take oh, me out of it. Yeah, well, obviously, I was just thinking of you yeah, straight away. Yeah, I could see it. It's tough, man. Come on, humour me. Antibots. 
<laughs> <laughs> and why would you like her to be like Hannah Bottman? She's going to love that, by the way. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, because Bots is very funny. Um, great dancer. Fair. I really enjoy her taste of like clothes and and she backs herself as well. And nice. I like that. I like that, I think. I can't imagine a little ward that isn't going to back herself, if I'm genuinely honest, <laughs> given who our parents are. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> um, very close second, Auntie Sunter. Oh, God, they couldn't get any further apart. Yes, yeah, so that. that's what I mean. Then you just <laughs> smush them Some together. Them Obviously, the nicest human, human. being yeah. ever. Who smiles at everything. Yeah. It's not about well, Hallie is very smiling. She is actually. Yeah. We saw some of Hallie's smiles. Yeah, I think she gets that from my dad. She does also <laughs> have um, occasionally RBF, you know, so where well, she'll just. She's got to have something for you, right? 100%. And do you think, obviously, going forward, you have aspirations to go back, play for England? Yeah. Dave, I know, has aspirations to go on and coach at the highest level. Yeah. Have you guys kind of chatted about. Because I think sometimes we see whether this is a norm that almost like one parent's career kind of goes yeah. and somebody else kind of takes the childcare load. Obviously, you guys are kind of on a bit of a path together alongside yeah. that. Like, have you chatted about kind of what yeah, and if? Yeah, and, and like those different windows and for me and what we've spoken about, like your play, playing career is only so long. Okay. So, you know, Dave will be coaching, I'm sure, for <laughs> as long as he's working. Yeah. Um, my playing career... Um, I would like it to last, you know, for as long as it can, but that will stop at, at some point. And so for for us, I guess the focus is on now that I'm fit again, my playing career, particularly, you know, on the international stage, obviously at club, but it's easier at club for us to manage. Yeah. When it's international, it's a bit more difficult and that's where we're really going to have to get that balance right. And it is going to be difficult. Um but yeah, I guess it's about both making little compromises and trying to see where we can fit Hallie in. We've got that support around us with with them, um, family, but also with the environments that we're in, yeah. with with the players, with the rest of the staff. Um, but yeah, I think hopefully at the moment I, I still want to achieve more. I still want to get back in a, in a white shirt. I know it's going to be hard. You're going to be really old. Not as old as UKE. <laughs> I'll as always have that. As old as Santa was? <laughs> nope. No, okay, no. fine. No. And that's the thing, I like, because I hung around with you guys, I think I got, <laughs> got an aged. unfair, yeah, aged, <laughs> unfairly aged, because I used to hang about, used to, with uh, you and Santa. Everyone thought we were the same age, which was ridiculous. It's because I look um, so youthful. Yeah, so Charlie Hayter came in the other day, actually, I caught up with him about oh, nice. some England stuff, and um, I did say to him, I was like, I'm not retiring after England. I was like, I am going to Australia, just to let you know. Just because I've had a baby does not mean I'm stopping. And I don't feel like I've only got two seasons left in me. That's cool. I, I like, when I, when Hallie, you know, when we found out we were having Hallie, I felt like those two seasons back to back, I was playing probably the best rugby that I've played. And I'm not ready to, to stop that yet. And I think I still had loads more to improve. I've still got loads more to improve where hopefully I can take my game even higher than that. So, yeah. I think that you look at the stories and I can definitely testify that having kids definitely made me a better rugby player. It gave me that perspective. And I know Marley talk, talks about yeah. it with Oliver. It just changed how she views her herself in the game and, and I suppose where rugby sits in her life as well. And it's that balance, isn't it? Um, you were probably similar to me. Um, I can take rugby sometimes far too seriously and because everything is under such a magnifying mm. glass and actually having you know, someone at home that you've got to rush back to feed. And it it just... Yeah, it stops it being so consuming, yeah, I think. it does. And then you can almost relax more yeah. and enjoy it. And like you say, have that perspective because that's huge. I think sometimes um, you lose sight of that. You're complaining about, you know, something which really, in the grand <laughs> scheme of things, does not matter. Um, and I think, you know, Marley's talked about how it's made her a better rugby player, as, as have you, and... Yeah, hopefully it'll make me a better rugby player. I'm sure it will. More importantly, though, the big question, what kind of touchline mum are you going to be when Hallie's playing sport? Chilled. Are Dave you? is going to be the opposite. Right, okay, so what about Dave then? Oh, Do you think he's going to be running down the touchline with it? He's going to be running down the touchline, shouting at the referee, 
probably shouting at Hallie, um, coaching, even if it's a sport he knows nothing do you about. Think he's going to coach her. He's going to be the dad, like whatever she decides to do. He won't be the coach, but he will be coaching. <laughs> yeah. And I'll be there going, shut up, Dave. God, it's so embarrassing. Dragon on by um, I think we'll be opposites. But yeah, yeah I, everyone says, oh, is she going to play rugby? I'm like, she can do what she wants. Genuinely, like, no pressure. And I suppose finally, be kind of wrong not to touch on it. Obviously, the girls have, have just headed off to WXV, obviously back to New Zealand. Like, for you, how does that feel? I suppose, A, knowing they're going back to New Zealand, but also, like, not being part of it. Yeah, it's so exciting. Everyone asked me when I was pregnant, they were like, are you missing it? Are you missing the Six Nations? And I was like, no, because I always knew I wasn't going to be playing. So it was really easy to kind of separate myself from that. And also I was play not playing for a great reason, something that I was even <laughs> yeah. more excited about. Now that I'm getting back fit, I am getting a bit of FOMO. I'm like, oh, wish I was there, wish I was playing, wish I was on the pitch particularly with the transition with new coaches coming in yeah. and they're obviously trying to have that evolution of the Red Roses game and everything that's going on in camp. Like, I really want to be part of that. Um, so I definitely do have more FOMO than I did kind of six months ago. Um, but more than anything, I'm just hugely excited um, speaking to the girls before they're going, you know, how they're feeling. And I felt like I was a bit more buzzing than than, um, <laughs> than someone else. I was like, yes, it's going to be awesome. You can do this, this, this. Please bring me back some workers. And for you, obviously, I'm assuming Six Nations is your, like, the international goal of when we might see you back in a white mm -hmm. shirt. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's the next, hopefully, fit. yeah, so to play November the 18th. So the next opportunity, the first opportunity that I can play will be the Six Nations. So that is the aim. It's going to be tough. Um, but yeah, um, I'm so excited. Like I said, with, with the new coaches coming in as well, the new players in the mix. Um, yeah. yeah, I love playing on the biggest stage possible. That is why I play rugby. Um so yeah, I want to get back back out there. And actually, even in that short time that I've been off, um, so much has changed. Like I've never had a name on the back of my shirt. And it, it's almost become like the norm, hasn't yeah. it? But it hasn't been that long that, that that's been yeah. happening. Um, obviously wasn't involved in that game at Twickenham. So I'd love to experience yeah. that. And yeah, I just, just want to get a lot of things on the list. There. Will you take Hallie as a mascot? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if I can, if she passes the test. <laughs> Abby, it's been an absolute pleasure. I think it is so insightful to see and hear all the kind of the journey that you've been on and, and just the start of your journey. So thank you so much for sharing your stories. Um, massive good luck. Thank you. Maybe not on November the 19th, but for the subsequent games after. And obviously, yeah. I can't wait to see what Ali, Hallie grows into and, and how your story develops. Yeah, and just on that as well... Um, Katie, we, we spoke about earlier, like, and you said, oh, you're the, you're the first person to have a baby and to set these standards. Well, these have been set prior to that and you, you're a big part of that in terms of kind of the example and, and what you've you've gone on to do. So if I can add a little bit onto that and then the next person can add a little bit onto that and we can keep pushing it. So, yeah, we're all heading in the right direction. Yes, high five. Freaking great job. Brought to you by British Airways, bringing original people, places and cultures together for more than a hundred years.